So welcome everyone. Today's speaker, Rita Dorf, is no stranger to Coleman Hall. She received her doctorate here in the Policy Organization Measurement and Evaluation Program. And she now works up the hill at the Lawrence Hall of Science, where she's the director of the research group. The research group develops assessments of learning in science and mathematics and applies this research to policy studies that evaluate the quality and impact of educational materials and programs. The focus is on understanding innovative STEM fields, especially those that aim to reach historically underserved and underrepresented populations. This work is used by educators, policymakers, and researchers. Rena is also the founder and principal investigator of the Learning Activation Lab. Her research focuses primarily on the relationship between learning experiences and outcomes, with particular attention to issues of equity, access, and impact. She's worked in the field of education research and evaluation for about 20 years. Before getting her doctorate here, she received her master's degree in the sociology of education from Teachers College at Columbia University, and she received her uh, bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of California, Davis. Since then, Rena has also worked in, a, in other high-level positions, such as UC's Office of the President as Director for the Research Policy and Technology in the Teacher Education and Professional Development Unit, and she was Lead Researcher and Coordinator for the School Restructuring Study for Senate Bill 1724. Today, she will speak to us about science learning activation, positioning youth for success. Um, the first thing you'll probably notice about me is I've only worked for places that have a lot of words in the title of where they are, so it's hard to say any of them uh, very quickly. But I'm here today from the research group that's at the Lawrence Hall of Science, that's at the University of California, Berkeley, and it's a mouthful to introduce myself that way each time. Um, how many of you are familiar with the Lawrence Hall of Science? Okay, so we're a, a uh, the University of California Berkeley's Public Science Center. We both have a museum floor on the top floor, which is kind of a public um, science center. And then down below the museum, there are people who do things like research, develop curricular materials, both for in and out of school, um, do professional development for science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Uh, there's a lot of work going on that weaves uh, literacy and science learning together, which we've done in partnership with folks at GSE. So there's a long history of, of collaboration and connection between Lawrence Hall of Science and um, the Graduate School of Education. And if anybody's interested in more information about what we do up there, feel free to ask me later. Um, one of the things I've been involved in over the last five years has been a, a project that's called um, the Activation Lab, and that's been a partnership uh, with the uh, folks at SRI, which is um, down on the peninsula, and the Learning Research and Development Center at the University of Pittsburgh. So you'll, when I'm talking about what I'm talking about, it's not just the work that I personally have done is work of many people, and you'll, it'll be obvious because no one person <laughs> has done everything I'll talk about. Um, so today I'm really going to tell you a, a story about the development of this concept called science learning activation. And one, it, it's, a, it's kind of an interesting story. It's interesting for many reasons, part of which is the what we've learned from it, but part of which is just the evolution of a very large-scale research project and how that happens and how um, people's um, ideas and interests all get incorporated into something that's quite large-scale. Um, and because I have way more to talk about than I could start, that I could ever talk about in one day, I want to just get a sense of who's in the room so I can kind of tailor um, what we'll focus on today. So I'm going to ask a few questions. And um, you can raise your hand if things apply to you. It seemed like an a efficient way to find a little bit more out. Um, if you had to, uh, are, how many people are in sort of research-oriented um, programs versus more like credential and practice-oriented programs? So research, practice, credential, OK. Um, and then, how many of you have any connection to thinking about STEM learning, science, technology, engineering, or math? 
okay? Um, and then, uh, if you would put yourself on kind of like, let's call it a sort of continuum, I really like to spend a lot of time thinking about qualitative data versus I really like to spend a lot of time thinking about quantitative data versus I love them both and I'm in the middle, I do a lot of mixed methods. Who's for qual? Okay, quantitative and who's mixed? Okay, great, something for everyone here. Okay, uh, I think that was all my questions. Um, so what I think I'm gonna do, given that there's something of everything in the room, is I'm gonna give a little bit of everything in this story and um, put things up there that I won't have necessarily time to dive in, but that's kind of intentional so that if you want to come back later and ask me for more information about any of um, the things I put up there or the paper or the poster that you could look at to see a deeper dive into something, this is kind of like just to whet your appetite for wanting to learn more. Um, feel free to stop me if there's questions or conversation you want to have along the way um, and we'll see how far we can get. So um, today's presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I call the ask, which is what we were asked to do that sort of launched this whole project. Um, then I'm going to give you a little bit about the background of the project and then the framework we developed in it and then the research we developed to investigate this framework and then um, what we've learned so far and then what we're looking forward to. And before I do that, I just want to ask for a minute for you to think um, when I say the words or the phrase science learning activation, think for a minute what that conjures up for you in your mind and talk to the person sitting next to you and, and kind of think about what you think I'm going to talk about today that falls under that title. So just have a moment, take a minute, talk to your, somebody sitting next to you and just uh, think about what you think I'm going to talk about today given that title. and he was really interested in learning more uh, about how he should figure out how to invest in science learning. If he wanted the biggest bang for his buck, uh, what should he do? <coughs> and he asked us that question. And should he go in school, out of school, after school, at home, media, like wherever. And, um, and out of that, we said, hmm, that's a really good question. It's a really hard one to answer, given what we know about science learning, because we don't have ways of comparing outcomes in the settings that you just described. We know a lot about what happens in schools relative to a set of outcomes that we use in schools. We know a lot about what happens, and less about what happens in after school, but using some outcomes there. We know something about museums and informal science centers. Um, but we really can't compare. So if you want to know the biggest bang for your buck, uh, you know, 
what do you think you're looking for? Like what would be a worthwhile bang in your mind and um, how much are you willing to spend and at what scale are you interested in impacting and who is your audience? So those were the kinds of questions we had back to him and ended up developing this set of questions in concert with him about the things he wanted to know um, to help him make investment decisions. So how can we effectively and efficiently support children in grades K to five, but not necessarily in schools, but in that age range to learn science and ways that develop and retain their ability to engage in critical inquiry. You can see the rest. Um, what types of learning opportunities, under what conditions, in what sequence, what is the role of setting and supporting and constraining learning opportunities, trajectories of opportunities, those are the kinds of things we were thinking about. And he came to us in part because the Lawrence Health Science is kind of unique in that we do work across all these settings. So he thought, if anyone's going to know, it's the people who are working in all these settings, and of course, you know the answer we gave him we got to do some research. So um, we came up with some guiding questions that seemed to us uh, to help consolidate some of those questions that we had. And we came up with this idea of activate. So how can we activate children's interest and curious minds in ways that ignite persistent engagement in STEM learning and inquiry? And then what positions youth for success? Those were kind of two questions about uh, science learning that, that helped us frame the work that we were going to be involved in. And I'm going to give you a little bit more background of what was happening at the time and has kind of persisted since in terms of the landscape of STEM learning. As, as Lloyd indicated, our group does a lot of policy research and contextualizing uh, science learning in a policy context. And so we were pretty aware that the thing that people were talking about, like in Washington, D.C., was this idea that there was a STEM pipeline, that um, there were a lot of people, kids, who were in uh, schools, and that very few of them made it through this pipeline all the way to a STEM, to become over here in the little cup, a STEM graduate from a degree. And even fewer ended up in um, a in an actual STEM career. And here there were people, including our uh, investor, and many, including the National Science Foundation and others, who were trying to build a diverse STEM workforce, and noticed, oh gosh, pipeline is leaking, pipeline is leaking, pipeline is leaking, and it's leaking all the diversity out of who ends up in STEM careers. So that was the pipeline metaphor that was in the policy discussion at the time, and still is a pervasive metaphor. The other thing that was happening, and I don't know how many of you were like, are tracking on all the various frameworks and reports and conceptual models, and here are the outcomes we care about for STEM learning. No, here are the outcomes we care, and actually they're all pretty similar, but they have different names and different reports. Um, turned them out, and so we had a lot of NRC reports, the National Research Council, which is what on, is on this side. We had in 2010, the President's Council on, um, I don't remember, it's called, it's called PCAS, I can't even see which what that stood for. We had NSF telling people, here are the outcomes you need to evaluate for. We had the after school uh, community coming up with a set of outcomes. And we had, of course, the next generation science standards emerging, which also had a set of outcomes. And people in the field are trying to make sense of this, like, you know, how does after school and in school and, and um, science centers all fit together to support kids, right, to learn science in a way that's coherent for them and builds towards a trajectory that enables them to participate long term. So um, we pushed all the frameworks aside for a minute, and we said, okay, we're gonna focus on learners is gonna be our focus within and across STEM learning settings. So we're gonna follow kids to try and understand what kind of learning um, experiences they have, how similar and different they are across settings, and are there features of learning experiences that are in common no matter where they, of, of successful learning experiences, <laughs> 
or effective learning experiences that are in common no matter what setting they're in, and what helps engage learners in STEM learning. So that was one of the things. The next thing we were scratching our heads about is, of course, the word STEM, because any of you who study math know that it's quite different than learning science, which is quite different from learning technology, which is quite different than learning engineering. There's some things in common, there's some things to build, but you know, to lump them all together at STEM and say, just because a kid is good at math or interested in math means they're also gonna be interested in science or the next engineer, it doesn't work out that way in the lives of kids. So we really um, decided just to start this endeavor that we were gonna focus in on science in particular, and the places it overlaps other places in STEM. Because of course there's mathematics related to science, and of course technology related to science, and of course there's engineering, but there's also parts of those disciplines that uh, might be a little bit separate from what we were gonna think about. So that's just to focus you on where we started and what the story is gonna mostly be about. It's mostly about science. So then when we ask ourselves these questions about um, activating children's interests and curious minds, we started to think, okay, what do we actually mean by science learning activation? So um, we came up with this name to act after we, we had this idea of what we were trying to characterize. And what we were trying to characterize was a composition of disposition, skills, and knowledge that enables success in proximal science learning experiences. So what are those dispositions, skills, and knowledge that support um, youth to be successful in their next most immediate learning experience? And um, I'll get to the specifics of, of what's in the box. I thought I had a little animation in there which wouldn't have shown you the <coughs> reveal so quickly, but um, didn't seem to come out on this one. But basically, um, there's this idea that that this activation, science learning activation, would lead to success in proximal learning experiences and that um, iterations of activation success, activation and success, build towards a long-term goal of STEM literacy for everyone and STEM careers for, other, for some people. So that if a, a person, a, a child, ends up with becoming activated towards science, then having success, then being more activated towards science, then getting, having more success, that eventually there's an accumulation of, of that over time that leads to the distal outcomes that were the holy grail of policymakers and NSF. So that was the theory we were trying to understand and the conceptual framework for it. And we asked our question, our question of ourselves, what are the disposition skills and knowledge, which we're gonna call activation, that would enable success? So we've come up with, and I'll unpack this as we go, you'll see more about it, but we've come up with four, and then we've come up with um, three or, here, this one, success variables um, that we think have this looping feature where if you become more fascinated with natural and physical phenomenon, value science for self and society, have higher competency belief, are able to engage in scientific sense making, these are kind of things that a person, kid, puts in, keeps in their backpack and carries with them from one learning experience to another and continues to um, build over time. And if you have those things, then it enables success, and we've defined success in a particular way, and this is success in proximal science learning experience. So, um, you know, what I'm doing now, not what I'm gonna do five years, 10 years from now. So choice to engage in science learning experiences. So that means if I have a choice to go to an art museum or a science museum, I'll choose the science museum, and that will build my um, disposition, skills, and knowledge about science learning even more. I'll engage positively when I'm there. What we mean by engagement is cognitive, behavioral, and affective engagement in the science learning experience. So I choose to go. When I'm there, I'm actually positively engaged. Next one is I perceive myself as successful in the experience. 
and I actually learned what the people who designed the experience wanted me to learn out of it. So that's how we think of success. I'm going to burrow down into that a little bit more. Um, for the uh, video lovers in the group, um, one of the things we've been able to do is collect some video data on uh, examples of what we mean by some of these things. And I'm going to play a couple. We don't have time for all of them. But by fascination, we mean fascination with a natural and physical phenomenon. Um, it refers to an individual's emotional and cognitive attachment with science topics and tasks. And we look, um, you'll, I'll talk about the large scale measurement um, later, but what it, it helps. I'm going to start it again. Hold on. So you can see these, this is an example of what we look for when we're talking about fascination. I'll get back to how we measure that in other ways, but before we could actually measure or start to do research on these in um, a large scale way, we actually had to identify each phenomena and what we thought we were going to see or try to measure in any large scale fashion. So videos, interviews, all sorts of in-depth portraits of individuals across time helped us really hone in on these different dimensions, what we call these fascination values, etc. Those are dimensions of activation. So um, by values we mean um, the degree to which learners value science, including the knowledge learned in science, the ways of reasoning in science, and the role that science plays in, plays in communities. By competency beliefs, we refer to the extent to which a person believes that she, or in this case he, is good at science. I'm going to play this one because it just cracks me up every time I... So now, for my third one, I might need a... I might want this paper. And... Can you, can you help Zach a little bit with this? He's got no, I can do it with, I can do it myself. <laughs> so you can see this guy has a lot of competency belief. He's going to do it himself. We won't talk about the other guy and what's going on there, because I use this as an example for competency belief. And then um, we also have scientific sense making, which I'm going to drill down a little bit more into when we get into the measurement part. Um, and then for the success dimensions, I explained them when the other chart is up, when the other chart was up, but here's just how we put them into words. I'll give you a moment to look at them, uh, rather than reading them off, because I think I explained it pretty well. Um, and then um, just to review, this is how we think the whole kind of theory or conceptual framework works. That learning experiences either support choices towards science, engagement in science, strong science learning, or they um, support kind of a downward trajectory. And the higher you are in science learning act whoops. Science learning activation, the more likely you are to go be propelled on the upward trajectory versus the downward trajectory. And we sometimes call that the downward trajectory kind of being deactivated towards science. And if you have been around STEM education for a while, you know that there's a lot of talk about how in middle school, um, we see significant drops in science interest and uh, uh, learning engagement by youth, especially girls. And so we were particularly interested in trying to figure out if there was a set of you know, resources, the things you could put in your backpack in elementary school that would kind of like keep you from the usual downward spiral. So was there something that could, uh, the funding, uh, the, the program officer who I mentioned early, or er, always like to call it like inoculate you against downward trajectory. Um, so we didn't, he was a medical person, so he used that word, but what was it you could do early on to support a kid to position them for success long term by what you do in the early, earlier years? 
So that was that's sort of the um, framework and theory. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we started studying it, but before I do that, I just want to pause, see if there are any questions or things people want me to recap about or say more about. Anything back there? Okay. So um, I'm going to go on to the research activity because part of the interesting part of this story is how elaborate this endeavor was. Because it was a private foundation who could fund what they wanted um, and had a real interest early on in doing it, they were able to pour a lot of resources into it early. And we mounted a pretty large multi-institutional um, research project pretty quickly in order to start working on this problem of what positions kids for success in science learning if you think about it before you get to uh, you know the dreaded middle school end of the dreaded middle school years so we did a couple things one is we looked at what we called stem pathways so we knew there was a lot of there were some existing longitudinal studies. There were people who were already acting at living lives as scientists and engineers who might be able to uh, give us some insight into what had enabled their success. So we took a, let's call a retrospective view on some um, on data firstly. So we looked both at a literature review about, uh, you know, everything has a literature review, I won't go into that. But um, basically thinking about what were the end states that we were looking for um, in, in like the success as an adult that you were looking for from the kid that you would position for success. What is that long-term success? We were looking at secondary data analysis of, of longitudinal data sets like NELS. We were identifying potential early indicators from some of those data sets. Um, we were looking at the issue of scientific literacy, and we were also doing a lot of life history interviews with STEM professionals to try and see what was it that supported them to become successful on those trajectories. The next kind of strand we were working on was actually measuring activation. So if we wanted to be able to do large-scale research on this, we certainly better have a set of measurement tools that was useful at scale. So we did a bunch of um, work there. You can see the various things. And I'll go into that in more depth, so I won't spend too much time. Um, the one other thing to note there, I'm not going to talk about it too much today, is that we always were ba balancing off the quantitative data from the qualitative data in order to make sure that we were to understand what our, our quantitative measures were and weren't capturing and what qualitative measures could and couldn't capture. And then we looked at um, this question of, well, does do these dimensions of activation actually enable success? So we looked at the relationship between activation, experiences, and success, um, both as case studies and as uh, large-scale data um, with a survey, a survey study, which I'll talk about. And our sense was the reason we were doing that was there were multiple applications for uh, the framework and the measures if we were to be successful. So one is to have a un unified framework to think about outcomes uh, that matter for, for young kids, for youth, in science learning across settings. So that was one thing we were looking for. Another thing is that um, we were looking for some support for intervention design. So could we help designers think about what was worth designing for in terms of their, their work, and which kinds of features of science learning experiences matter in which kind of settings if you were a person trying to make interventions for kids that would support their success in science learning. There was also some interest by some people, and this hasn't gone so far yet, in, in thinking about a diagnostic assessment. Like if I know the kid coming into my program is really high fascination, but really low sense making, would I design or in intervene differently than if I knew that they were really high sense making, but they really couldn't care less about science? So th those kind of questions were on people's mind. Um, 
they also, people, oh, the holy grail of could we actually have some summative outcomes that we could say, like, I measure a kid, um, kid's activation in sixth grade, and I have a way of linking it to long-term consequential outcomes. Because for program evaluation, which we do a lot of in my group, um, you know, it's always the question of, like, are you going to, if, if a program targeted at middle school age kids wants to say, and this program helps a kid be successful and become a scientist, how do you do that unless you can have long-term data, longitudinal data? We all know how hard that is to accomplish. And so if we could actually have a set of studies that linked these early outcomes to distal outcomes, then people wouldn't have to follow kids all that time to be able to make that claim. So there was a lot of interest in that. And then the evaluation tools and protocols, which I'll talk about a little more later. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've learned in three different ways. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we learned with pathways. I'm just going to like wet your whistle. And if you want more, we have a few papers written on it that I can send your way. And then I'm going to spend most of my time on the measures and um, the, what we learned about activation. So if you recall the leaky pipeline metaphor, we kind of debunked that and said that actually doesn't reflect the data that we're seeing that only, that, that um, well, I'll show you what we were seeing. So what we were seeing is if you look at um, the, the longitudinal databases, you don't see just one pipeline where people are leaking out over time. You actually see multiple pathways that people take towards, this is, um, this is, let's see, college, wait, okay, this is end of um, high school, this is end of college, and this is workforce. Okay, so by end of college, you see a lot of people who have neither, I'll step back and say, um, the things we looked at as kind of indicators of the usual pipeline story was the usual pipeline story has kids having finished calculus by 12th grade and having an interest in a STEM career by 12th grade. So the assumption of that whole pipeline metaphor is that both those things need to be true by the end of college or you've already leaked out. So we've noticed that um, a large group of people who finish college um, have neither career interest in, uh, neither, cal have neither taking calculus or have career interest in um, a STEM career. So that's this whole group. Another group have interest in a career, but no calculus. Another group have calculus only, and the top one have both. So the top little group up there is the one that's the traditional pipeline group. And the other people are all the people who we thought leaked out already. But lo and behold, actually, some of them do end up in the STEM workforce. And many actually end up with degrees. As a proportion of the pool that you have at the end of college, there are actually you know, a larger proportion of the top group end up going on. But an equal number if not more, from this group go on than from the top group. There's a paper written about this. If this is interesting to you, I'm happy to send it your way. It's actually all on the Activation Lab website as well. But we started to tell a different story. We started to tell a pathway story, and we started to ask ourselves questions about you know, what was different for in early experience for kids who ended up in these different pathways. Um, part of also how we looked at that was this is a version of a life history calendar. We did um, almost a hundred retrospective interviews with people who were in um, science careers or STEM careers actually, both as like bench scientists but also as faculty or industry people or STEM related careers and started to try and get a sense of what did their pathway look like? And you can see we did it by um, grade along the way. 
Again, papers written on the website, if those are things that are interesting. But that kind of helped us understand the lay of the land that we were looking at using um, data that looked backwards. Then we started to say, okay, now we need some prospective data. Like, how are we going to know um, and understand the experience of kids living today moving forward? Because as you know, like some of those longitudinal databases are now from kids whose experience was 25, 35 years ago, and we're not sure how relevant some of that is to the situation that people find themselves in today. So we looked at some various ways of um, being able to assess activation. Surveys, observations, performance tasks, interviews, interactives, and started to ask these questions about ev which evidence would be most compelling, what is the fit of each kind of assessment type for each learning setting, and which strategies would best capture which aspects of activation. We actually have um, different instrumentation in all these areas. The one we've worked most at is our measures to scale, at scale, because we wanted to be able to look at large patterns over lots of kids over time. So we focus mostly at measuring individual learner outcomes so we could look at these patterns across settings and learners because as you saw from our initial questions, many of our questions were about can you compare the outcomes from this kind of experience to that kind of experience? So in order to measure this at scale, we knew we had to meet a bunch of criteria. Our measure could not be specific to learning settings, meaning it had to be equally as good a measurement tool whether a kid was sitting in a classroom, sitting on a beach, sitting in a, um, at home. So it had to work everywhere the same. We knew shorter was better because in some of the settings, there's no way they're going to let a kid sit in front of a piece of paper or an iPad or whatever for longer than 30 minutes tops. Um, it had to be really easy to administer, it had to be easy to score, and it had to be at a grade three reading level if we wanted kids in fifth, sixth, seventh grade to be able to take it. Um, so we went through a very extensive development process to get to our scaled, um, uh, our at scale instrumentation that included some of the things I mentioned before, the interviews, the observations, the retrospective, etc. but it also <coughs> included a lot of quantitative studies, which I'll talk a little bit about more. Um, and then in the end, we ended up with a bunch of different uh, survey type uh, uh, assessments that we've used in our research. This is one depiction of them. You'll see another later. And what it's showing you on the right is we've been experimenting with putting these on apps so that kids can actually take them without being connected um, at the time that they're taking it. So we have a tablet-based version that's offline, a tablet online, and uh, um, a computer-based online, and even we do paper sometimes too. Um, and um, just in, for those of you who are interested in the kind of measurement work we did, don't have time to delve deep, but again, we have papers written on each of these, and we have tech reports about each um, of the dimensions, the scales, that are on the website as well. But um, this will give you a sense of the kinds of questions that we used or items that we used. So, Fascination ended up being an eight item um, scale, and it has questions like, in general I find science very interesting to very boring. In general, when I work on science, I think it's cool. Our scale, if it doesn't say anything else, um, we have one scale we often use, which is big yes, uh, all caps yes with an exclamation point, we should have brought it, uh, all small letter yes, small letter no, Big no with exclamation point. So most of these are on that. For values, we also have eight items. And this is, believe you me, it took many iterations to get to eight items that worked. Because first we had a lot, a lot of items, and then we whittled down, and then we expanded, and then we whittled down. But um, we're very happy to be at eight items that work. Because, of course, the timing is a big constraint for us. So um, values, do you think science is useful in your life? 
Do you think you could become a scientist someday? Competency beliefs. I can do the science activities I get in class. If I went to a science camp for kids my age, I could understand what's going on. We have a variety of questions that are in there too. And then scientific sense making was the toughest nut to crack, as you might imagine. Um, there was a lot in it that we were trying to think about. And we identified basically five sub-dimensions that we were going to include. We don't measure at the sub-dimension, I mean we don't, um, yeah, measure at the sub-dimension level. We measure at the scientific sense-making level, but it includes questions about questions, about experiments, in, about evidence, about explanations, and about the nature of science. Um, we know there are things left out of it. We know there are things that we do more of uh, in general. The function of it has been um, working for us in terms of answering one question. And this one has 12 items. And um, is um, I'm going to say a little bit about some of the challenges that, well, actually I'm not because we're going to run out of time. So if you want to know about, more about scientific sense making, we have a paper about that too, which I can, yes? Do you like just one example of a sense making item? I do. Um, we actually, here I was one thing I didn't put in this uh, presentation, but I do have it. Um, one moment. You know what, let me come back to it at the end and get it for you. Um, but we ended up doing sense making in um, a particular way. I'll, I'll give one more moment. We, we embedded um, the questions within kind of content-based scenarios because um, we didn't want uh, to assume a lot of prior content knowledge, but we wanted the sense-making items to be embedded in science content. So we um, have four different versions of scientific sense-making right now. One has an uh, extinction of monkeys scenario in it. One has an extinction of dolphins scenario. One is related to um, eagles, and then one is related to the newest one that we're about to go out with is about lung cancer. And so each one embeds a bunch of questions around um, argumentation questions and, um, you know, what kind of questions would you ask to figure this out and interpretation of data within the context of a particular scenario. I'm happy to share it with you more specifically. Sure. Like multiple choice? Or? They're O's. Yes. yes. They are now all multiple choice. We actually started with a version that had a lot of open-ended and constructive response. We spent a lot of time working to make a version that, um, a multiple choice version that's correlated with the, the one that had all those open-ended and constructive response. So we have a 95% correlation between um, the result, like the final scientific sense-making score that we get from the open-ended versus the one we get from all closed-ended. And this was part of our press because while we would love to have open-ended items because we think they're a more rich way of getting at scientific sense-making, the at-scale piece of that made it a very expensive proposition in many ways. So we worked uh, quite significantly on many, this is the one that's taken us, as you might imagine, the longest to get to a place that we feel like it's useful and um, it still has you know, work that we're trying to do to improve some of it, including we've had some issues on like, with all of these, we had some issues on ceiling effects. So we've had to push really hard to get hard enough questions in each um, scale. But in most of them, we've, uh, we have the, uh, a few ways we've done that, which I can talk about later. Um, I'm just laughing because one of my, um, colleagues calls the, 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 the strategy we use the would you kill your mother strategy, meaning like we have to make this question so hard, like would you rather, would you, do you like, would you be willing, you know, to do something so awful as that versus 
science. So it's a bad it's a bad joke, but it's the way we sort of shorthand like getting harder questions was you had to make it like you had really hard to agree with some of them, especially on the attitudinal front. Because a lot of kids will shine you on really quickly and say, Yeah, I love science, big yes, big yes. And it, in order for them to think twice about giving you the big yes, which is the socially accepted answer, you actually have to give them something that's pretty hard to endorse. Um, we never use, though, the actual. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then the choice uh, assessment, because we had to develop the measures of success as well in order to do our, um, do our research. That we have a choice preference um, assessment. We have an engagement assessment that we give at the end of a science learning experience. That's like eight items, magic number. And um, it takes like five minutes for kids to do right at the end of a particular science learning activity. We've given it at the end of class. We've given it at the end of a visit to an exhibit. We've given it at the end of an after school program session. Um, we've given it at the end of a TV show and a movie. So you can give it after any kind of thing like that. And then perceived success is the other thing we've been measuring. The learning piece, um, you'll recall there's a learning um, success variable as well. We usually choose a learning assessment that's deeply contextualized in the experience the kid is having. So because the learning um, success measure is that they actually learn whatever was expected to, for, for them to learn from the experience. That's been um, one that we actually can't do uh, in a way that crosses settings because it's totally contextually based. Um, but in the context of the studies we've done, we've mostly been um, choosing something and designing it ourselves so that we can uh, do that really cleanly. So. Um, I'm not going to get through all the uh, what we've learned. I just wanted to show you one of the ways we approached learning was through stories, individual kids, where we look at their activation score and we look at the interviews and observations and their cases really closely and try and paint a picture of who they are and how their activation sort of has enabled success for them or deactivation has not. Um, we have two large-scale studies that we have been under, uh, uh, engaged in. They're both called AILS. One is AILS 11, and that is activate, activate, Activated Learning Enables Success, is what AILS stands for. And study is the study, and 11 is the year. So we did a large one in uh, 2011 in 10 schools. Um, and this is, we used the uh, assessment that they were doing, a FOSS assessment that was uh, already developed. 38 sixth grade classrooms, broad range of diversity, four months of instruction, pre post content tests, engagement measured four times, choice preference measured at the beginning of the end to end. And um, again, we have a paper on this as well, but basically we started to look, I'm going to show you the, this one. We looked at um, the relationship between pre, these are correlations, pre to the success variables and success variables to post, and we saw that there were relationships between each of the uh, dimensions and at least one of the success variables and each of the success variables and at least one of the dimensions showing that they are each doing different work. So one of the things you could ask is how highly connected are these things? Like if you have one, do you have all of them? Not necessarily so. These four things actually are pretty independent. Um, fascination and values are actually the highest correlated to one another of any of the four. Uh, then the next thing you could ask is like, do they each do independent work towards the, the um, the success variables, and then you could ask about this, does that actually feedback loop as we had or predicted that having higher levels of these would actually support change in activation over time? And we saw evidence in this first study of all that. With this evidence, we were able to um, actually um, 
write a couple successful NSF grants. So up till this point, this was mostly funded by this private foundation. At this point, we were able to start getting other um, funding for the work. And oh, one other thing to say from that study is we also started to look at these possibility of activation profiles. We used to have a fifth dimension called perceived autonomy. That got kicked out for many reasons, which is uh, another part of the story, but it wasn't doing the work that we um, had hypothesized that any dimension of activation would need to do to be considered a dimension of activation. And it was very difficult to measure well. So um, one of the things though this shows you is that we started to look at these activation profiles. So we saw um, that 3% of the group of students that we had looked at had low everything. 14% had high everything. And many of them, if this is a really interesting story that we've continued to follow, had this low scientific sense making and high everything else. Rah, rah, I love science, but I really don't think of it as a sense making activity. I'm thinking about it as, you know, how many forms of dinosaurs can I name or something like that. Um, and then there's some that have uh, a lower but everything positive. And then you, you can just see, we started to see these various patterns. So this is a story we want to follow long term to see are there clusters and profiles. And part of the reason this is interesting to us, it goes back to some of those um, design and diagnostic questions, right? Like if you knew a, you had a group of kids who were met a certain kind of profile, you might design experiences differently. Okay, so now the study we've started now is called ALS 14, because we started in 2014. And basically this kind of just tells you the kind of information we're collecting through this current study. Um, we have a cohort of kids we're studying six, to six going into seventh grade, and we have a cohort of kids that we study go eighth going into ninth grade. We've done them concurrently. We're about to start the second, like the seventh and ninth grade piece, and struggling to keep hold of the kids who move from eighth to ninth grade. Um, and we are collecting these kinds of data. So the activation assessment, all these assessments are um, what we're collecting. And then um, we also get state tests at eighth grade. And um, we have a career interest survey also that we've been using. And we have an activity log that the teacher completes so we understand what's happening in their classes. Um, so this is more information will follow, but we have some early data from this one that um, I think I won't show too much right now, but if you're interested, I can share it with you another time. Hold on, it's got a lot of arrows. Okay, so now looking forward, um, we have some interesting other like side detours we've taken. I told you the main story, but of course with every good story there's a lot of like turns and twists. So some people said, okay, great, you can tell us something about kids 11 through whatever, but what about the youngest kids? Like how are we going to know, um, you know, if kids are set up to become activated or if they're early, at, what early activation looks like? before you can measure four dimensions. So we had one, um, one evaluation um, client who has a project for kids six to nine year old. And we started to toy around with, okay, if we were gonna air, uh, if we were gonna look at something that we call early STEM learning activation, what would that look like and how would we measure it? So here we're, we didn't try to get uh, measures of all four dimensions separately. We tried to get something that looked like an early activation scale. And um, because in young kids also these things, like you can see the items, some of them are two things at once, right? Like I want to be an inventor, maybe about fascination or it may be about values. Um, so we, we just 
we lived with the mush and we said, we want to get the general gist. Is this kid on a course towards being uh, someone who we can measure as activated or as high on these other on these dimensions as they get older? So this was the uh, assessment we gave. These uh, that was the scale we had, and um, we gave it to like 600 kids in a program and. It actually did some nice work for us in the evaluation, um, and the psychometrics of it looked pretty good. So we were pretty happy that we could do anything with young kids in a survey that was starting to near something that we felt comfortable with. So I say that just to say we're thinking about younger kids too. There's more work to be done in this area, and we hope to be able to go there soon. The other thing I'll say is that We've done a lot of work in STEM programs more broadly than science. So we have some, you know, engineering camps and maker spaces and all those kinds of um, STEM hodgepodge, let's call it, um, activities. And, um, and uh, we started to think about, okay, if we were thinking not about science learning activation, but some more broad kind of STEM learning activation, which the field really wants us to have, uh, what might we add? So we added something called innovation stance, um, which is another dimension, uh, something that kids, supports kids' success in STEM learning activities, especially the maker engineering kind of spaces. Um, we added this idea in addition to scientific sense making, which actually doesn't show up in many more STEM generic kind of places, or even in the maker spaces, we added more like creative thinking and problem solving. Now I say that, and the only one we actually have a measure for that's working is innovation stance. We actually haven't tried to develop the creative thinking or problem solving in the way that we do this one. There are tons of creative thinking and problem solving uh, assessments out there. We have particular constraints for any one we, we develop, and so we just haven't gone there yet. Um, but it is an area we're interested in thinking about longer term. Um, just to give you a sense of what these things look when you think about STEM, the new one um, that I mentioned, innovation stance, is the enthusiasm for new ideas, for trying new ways of doing things, for sharing ideas with others. If you spend a lot of time around the maker, rhetoric or any of the, the work that's being done in like the community science workshops, etc. This idea that kids develop, um, you know, a stance towards innovation that's important to their long-term success is, is all over the place. Um, we're also looking into alternative measurement approaches. We, you know, the survey is awesome, but many of us hate it. Right? You hate sitting a kid who's going to a museum or doing, going on a beach or you know, at home watching a movie in front of a survey and saying, hey, take my survey. It's totally antithetical to the actual learning experience they're having. So we've needed it to conduct the research that we're doing. And now what we want to understand is, is there, are there ways to uh, assess activation that's more uh, well of a fit for like informal and out of school learning environments. You can get far with the survey in schools, in other places, you know, the, the it just, uh, people bristle when they have to take it. So um, we have this project that's currently um, just in uh, the uh, proposal phase, but the idea would be that we would try out a version of assessing science learning activation, um, the different dimensions in, um, there's a ARG game, an alternate reality game that we've been um, connected to a professor working on at University of Maryland who's embedded some ways of assessing uh, the different dimensions of activation inside the game and then concurrently given our, our survey um, to game players and we're trying to look at the relationship between what we learn from the back end data from the game and the survey to see if we could not use the survey and just use the data from the game. 
Um, we have an app that's that floor tracking, and then there's um, another project that's a citizen science project, and in each case, we're trying to embed experiences that are authentic to the learning experience they have in ways that we could actually capture data about activation. So we're super excited about being able to do this because we hate our survey as much as we love it, and I'm hoping that we get there soon. And then the last thing I was going to mention is that we have a grant also from the National Science Foundation. It's called ACT App. And it's basically trying to take all the research tools that you heard me talk about and turn them into an app that evaluators could use to help them with evaluation. So the protocols, the assessments, etc., in ways that um, are easy for other people to use. So that's a couple things have been part of that. One of them was what I talked about before, of transforming our open-ended to closed-ended questions and getting um, a sense that they were correlated well enough to feel comfortable just going with the open-ended, uh, the, the new closed-ended. And then um, transposing our instrument <coughs> into a tablet and uh, platform. Um, and then we're about to, so we have all those things sort of in, in beta version, and we're about to launch um, a kind of, we call it the in the wild study of getting about five evaluators across the country to just try and use this with us watching them so that we see, like, do the tools work? Are the instructions clear? Are they, do they actually learn something from them? Are they a good enough fit with various different kinds of programmatic environments? So um, that's where we are with this one. And uh, it should be, uh, we have one more year left on it. So in a year we should be able to say, and now we have an app you can use. Um, so anything more you want to learn, you can go to the Activation Lab website, you can go to the Research Group website, or you could just send me an email and I'll send you or, or point you where you need to go. So um, any questions, conversation? You want me to dig up the scientific sense making thing while you're thinking of your questions, I can do that. Yes? Um, did you see any correlation between any demographic variables and your, your variables of um, scientific activation? question. Um, so um, we did not, uh, we were looking for um, a way to understand, we didn't want what we were doing to be predicted by by um, demographic variables, but we also understand how some of them are influenced by them. So we were spending a lot of time thinking about this. Um, and I would say that it's a subject of the study that we're currently involved in, um, and less so of the previous one. So I'll have more to say soon. The interesting thing is that we didn't just use um, demographic variables. We also have a couple um, scales we developed ourselves uh, that we called, let me see where I can find it here. Uh, we have a family learning scale and we have a home resources scale. So like we um, looked at like things like co computer and internet access in the home and um, books and things like that. And so we're not just looking at the traditional demographic variables, we're also looking at some of the home resources. So I'll have more to say soon, but it's definitely a topic of conversation. And so far, so good. Everything that we've needed to check out has checked out okay. But there are patterns, you know, across um, large groups of kids. But kids end up, you know, kids from every group actually do both well and bad <laughs> on these measures. So yeah. Have you thought about using these uh, instruments? and perhaps in particular the profiles on teachers because uh, it seems to, seems to me that they would also have uh, quite a range of, of uh, appearances among these, I guess it's now four, uh, four factors. Yeah, so it's interesting that you say that. We actually have had a lot of conversation about um, the question of the degree to which uh, 
a teacher's level of activation themselves might um, be predictive of their classroom learning environment or how they portray science or how they portray, but we haven't explored doing that yet. Right now our, our measures are designed for kids ages 11 through 14 um, and you know I think we would need um, a lot different question set for some of the teachers, but we could try it and see. Yeah. <laughs> I think I, I maybe have lost the uh, conclusion for the scales. Uh, one of the things that, that I guess I'm trying to figure out is like when the when the Moore Foundation came to you with this question about which environments are better yeah. for learning, uh, I, I can't see the connection now to these scales. Like, is there like an overall knowledge scale that you found that would satisfy the Moore question? So um, it's a, that's a good question. So. Um, the connection is that uh, at a certain point, once these, the, we feel confident that the measures are measuring what we want them to do, and the, um, we have the data sets that we've been trying to collect, we should be able to start to understand and use these instruments in ways that allow us to compare learning environments. So we have yet to compare learning environments. We have now uh, put in a couple study proposals now that we have confidence in the measures, we put in a couple study proposals to look at the influence of environmental features or experience um, characteristics on the development of activation. And at that point, we may end up at the place where we could answer some of these questions, like what's the bang for the buck of this investment over this investment, if you buy that activation as a good set of measures on which to make that conclusion. So. It, it took a lot, um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of the, the way we've proceeded. And the other thing that there, you know, we're two program officers later at the Moore Foundation, and they've kind of thinking a little bit differently now, but um, I think one of the things that they were interested in at the time was having a set of measures that grantees could use to help them with some accountability over if experiences were leading to the kinds of outcomes that they were interested in. And they were very interested in activation as an outcome, probably for many of the reasons that you guys all talked about what it means to you, um, and how we instantiated it in these four things kind of captured a lot of different outcomes that the field has been talking about in terms of, of important outcomes for STEM. So I think that's where we are with that. Does that other questions, or should I find this scientific sense making? I found it. So. Oh, you did? Oh, <laughs> awesome. On the website. So I think you're looking at one of the versions, dolphins. dolphins and oh, you've got dolphins and monkeys there. So you should be able to see both sets of um, questions. Anything else? Questions? Conversation? Well, thanks so much for your, oh, wait, did you have? Um, I, I do, I, this, is a, this is probably an obnoxious question, but it's one model of what causes people to go into science uh, maybe takes place after this, like in ninth grade or 10th grade when grades really start mattering totally. for college, that students and parents see how they did on their first semester grade or their yeah. first year grades, and then they decide, oh, this isn't for me, or that's not for you, or you're gonna have to try harder, or I'll try harder. And that, that really all these earlier things, you know, sixth grade, eighth grade experiences don't matter that much when it's sort of warm, fuzzy, pet the dolphin kind of experience. And then it's like brass tacks, what are you going to do? And, and some of these things may continue on, you know, the fascination might sustain you and so forth, but a lot of it is this uh, just hard numbers feedback that people are getting. Yeah, so, I mean, totally true. In fact, in the retrospective studies that we, we um, did, a lot of people talked about those very issues in um, high school and college especially. I mean, talk about <laughs> being weeded out and learning more about what you don't want to do than what you do want to do. That's just like an iterative process of I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to do that, based on the feedback that you're talking about. So one of the things that um, we're trying to understand, and, and our, our approach has been 
to start with this transition between middle elementary and middle and then middle and high school to understand what's happening in that period of time when this interest wanes and then we're moving out in both directions with an earlier set of longitudinal studies and a later and trying to connect the dots across these concurrent longitudinal studies so that it doesn't take as long as like the lifetime of people <laughs> to learn everything that we want to know. Um, it's a little bit of a tricky way of approaching it, but um, what I would say is that um, one of the things that we're trying to understand is, I don't know if you were, in my world, the uh, Science Magazine article that Ta Robert Ty published, I don't know if any of you are, uh, at, which was around the same time that we were launching this, um, really kind of like, set things in motion for a lot of the policy related uh, research that was going on. He had a study that showed that, and it was the same uh, data set that we used for that pathways diagram, but it showed that interest by eighth grade was more predictive of uh, uh, degree um, at, uh, at the end of college, STEM degree, than was um, math test scores. So this sort of like propelled a whole like, oh, interest is more important than we thought. Let's look at interest. So there's a whole bunch of research that looked like that. And we were caught up in that, but the question was, what was it in those longitudinal data sets that he was really seeing and that we came to see about the role that developing interest early on plays? It's not the only thing, but it was significant, it was predictive of you know, finishing with a degree and even more than math um, test scores were at that same point. So this is what started this whole conversation. So there's no one who thinks that it's the only thing that matters, but there's some question about what is the mechanism by which interest and does matter at that point. And so that's kind of where we're, we're trying to ferret it out. And I didn't think it was obnoxious at all. <laughs> Anything else? Oh, yeah? So I was wondering uh, about your life history study and what were the conclusions of that and how, if at all, it was related to the multiple pipeline chart that you had? Yes, yeah, so um, we currently have a team that's actually writing a paper that sort of looks at the retrospective interviews that you're talking about overlaid to some of these, these four pathways to understand, like, the nuances of what happens for people in those pathways. There are several um, posters on the website that will um, that I can point you to that actually uh, show a bunch of the results. Um, the results on that aren't like clean, like here's our set of findings. There are several studies that came out of that. One about like what is the trajectory of the unusual suspects, the, the folks who you didn't expect to end up in STEM careers. Another study was about um, the, these uh, kind of four archetypes which are characterized in one way by the pathways diagram, but it's got a really interesting poster about the kinds of um, supports and gatekeepers for each of the different pathways. So those are in um, the posters that are on the website under, I think, in the research tab. And then there's one about gender there too, so there's some interesting ones. Given the time, I think we sh should wrap up. And then if there's anything else people wanna know about, please email me, check the website, come visit us up on the hill, except not on a hot day, because it's really hot up there. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you.